Hello everyone, welcome back to the Soul Food Podcast. I'm your host, Ailey Graham. And before we jump into the episode, I wanted to remind you to please follow us across social media on YouTube, Spotify, so that you can know when we upload and know the other events that we've got going on. This episode I filmed with Monique from London and we had some great chat and some good laughs. So without much further ado, enjoy. Hello everyone and welcome to episode one of the Soul Food Podcast. It is a pleasure to be on your screen or in your ears today. Um, (laughs) You may have guessed from the title that today's topic is excellent and praiseworthy. Uh, That's a reference to a Bible verse that we want to dive into today and uh, we're also going to have a bit of fun. So I thought who's wise about the Bible and also fun? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and that <laughs> led me to Monique. <laughs> Welcome, Monique. Thank you. Good to have what, you. It's what an great. honor. <laughs> <laughs> it's great to uh, to see you virtually. Um, Monique, tell the audience a little bit about yourself. Well, hello. Um, yeah, as you know, I'm Monique. Uh, I work for Coinonia, which is the UCO uh, here in London. I'm originally from London and also serving here, which is maybe a little unusual. I enjoy it a lot. Uh, yeah, as Amy said, I just finished studying. I did my master's in biblical studies, which really enjoyed. It was pretty tough, but I got through it. <laughs> now I'm on the other end. There is a real world at the end of the university life, and it's not so bad. <laughs> um, I don't know what have I been doing. Uh, in lockdown, I have some new activities. I've got into running. But I've also got into pasta making. So it's like balance, you know. Pasta making from scratch. Yeah, yeah from scratch. My, my flatmates for my birthday bought me a pasta roller been the best new purchase of lockdown like a proper like you Italian turn it one, out yeah. and and you like you wedge it to the table wow <laughs> so we made tagliatelle last week it was great <laughs> well there you go folks <laughs> <laughs> wait not only are you qualified in theology you're qualified in italian cuisine um pasta. well just pasta <laughs> just pasta okay not not everything <laughs> that comes with it okay so The title of this um, podcast is Excellent and Praiseworthy, which is a reference to Philippians 4, 8. um, And I'll read that to us now. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. It's pretty... uh, it's pretty nice. It's a nice part of the Bible. Yeah. Um, it's a it's a nice concept, and I think the the first thing that that comes to my mind is that's nice, but is it possible um, mm. in our world and in our lives? There seems to be so much that challenges us not to think uh, of good things, not to think of excellent, and and particularly. I don't know if it's if it's a cultural thing or something, but skepticism is like quite high, and cynicism, you know, and and being able to say, well, it's not a hundred percent perfect, or you're, you know. So, Philippians four eight. What came up for you, Monique, when you read that? Um. Yeah, I think I really agree with you. I've been on quite a journey with this verse over the past couple of weeks. You know, since you asked me to come on here, I think at first I was like, oh my goodness. I don't think I can talk on this at the moment because it is, it sounds like, oh, think of nice things, think of really things almost. And I just uh, very honestly don't feel in that place at the moment. I think when I look at the world, I'm like, oh my goodness, it's awful. And generally I'm not like a cynic in personality, but I feel like I've sort of (laughs) been one recently. Um, But I think that's kind of the way you approach a lot of like well-known scripture. This is one of those verses that we hear a lot and we're very familiar with. 
yeah. so we kind of come at it with all these presuppositions and that's the kind of like oh it has to be nice things and we have to be always happy and always joyful and the smiley Christian <laughs> yeah um I think as I've kind of dwelt in the verse I realized that's not really what it's getting at it's not thinking like think of nice things and get rid of everything else um like the kind of the list there like as you really like think about each word Mm. it's kind of it's vast you know and I almost think it kind of covers all of the Christian life like these are all aspects of God's character and of course we should meditate on them and kind of look out for them in the world um and kind of almost like our mandate as Christians this has kind of been what's come out of it for me is to spot aspects of God's character in the world which Mm. is that list um and yes there's loads of suffering and awful things happening um but at the same time there's glimpses of all this like what's true what's noble what's excellent is in there amidst it all Mm. yeah Yeah. I often think you know particularly today as we social justice is such a um a big topic uh, and there's a lot of righteousness in standing up for the oppressed and standing up and and um calling out injustice Uh, but any of us that have done that in any sense feel the weight of it and you feel the the taxation of the world where if you um are supporting um black lives matter and you don't tweet also about yemen (laughs) you're a hypocrite you know (laughs) and there's something there's something in there that's like a there's a there's a real pressure of like lose lose you know I, i'll always i'll never be good enough for the call of social justice and i think that that is something that jesus gives a lot of comfort in that we're in the pursuit of jesus um, and he was a social justice warrior <laughs> jesus was the kind of yeah. pinnacle <laughs> of social justice but in the the purest and and most loving form and so the pursuit of him i find is one a lot more peaceful than trying to kind of in this worldly sense pursue justice um but it's also more complete um which is not surprising you know (laughs) he he tends to to represent something of that um but it is uh it's an interesting um kind of I don't know if it's dichotomy or something, um, but you know, does this mean? Does this verse tell us to just think about good things and ignore what is bad uh, because it's not of God? You know, um, but we know from history and from how we've been taught that ignorance doesn't bring about any, you know, peace or goodness or godliness, um, and so there's there's this. I find a lot of our peers, a lot of Christians in our circles um, are grappling with this right now. And and I think it's a righteous thing and a, and a good thing to be mm. doing. Um, but it is a, it's so like tempting or, or um, yeah, it, it kind of attracts despair, this, this idea, um, because it does feel like I can't win. You know, the other thing that I um that struck me from this um was that as they're listing it, it it reminded me of um the armor of God, and there was something in it that kind of struck me as like, is this alluding to putting on a mental armor of God, um, and being able to find and see, like you say recognize um god in the in everything uh, and find the excellent and find the the praiseworthy and stuff um and that was quite comforting i guess um because it was it's it's clearly think and not do he's saying think about them so it's something about training the mind Mm -hmm. uh, to to put on this christ-like i guess um thinking yeah yeah and that's why i think it's almost a shame that we've kind of 
translated it as like think about these things because I think in our like modern concept of think it's kind of very much in the brain and not much action and I think I like that the kind of the way of saying it is meditate because like you said as you meditate on something you're wanting to become like that and if this is list is God's character and we want to become <laughs> like Christ we're going to meditate on it we're going to weigh it up um, and I think also back on your previous point um about kind of the weight of social justice I really like got into that kind of pit recently and was kind of like thinking you know some people refer to social justice as rearranging deck chairs on the Titanic <laughs> which is a very kind of very despairing fatalistic way to look Whoa, at it but yeah. I kind of thought well is it to an extent like the problem is it's so vast and something what, what really got me out of this kind of pit was there was a nun in Ohio in Cincinnati during the, some of the kind of protests that have happened in the wake of George Floyd. And she was graffitiing <laughs> on, the, on the boards outside of her house saying, the world will change when hearts change. And I just thought it's so simple, but so powerful. And actually that's what we're going after. Like actually to have concrete long-term systemic change, we need hearts to change. You know, you can campaign till you're blue in the face and not much is gonna change until the individual hearts of lawmakers and leaders and even civilians and like your next door neighbors change. And I thought, that was so helpful and it kind of pulled me out of that kind of <laughs> despairing attitude. Um, yeah, totally. I was thinking recently with the disconnect from sense of community in our society has come a disconnect from accountability. Um, and so what is, what is natural to the human is to be formed and you know, um, ch chiseled away by the, the the society around them, by the community around them, and this the whole sense of it takes a village um, is that yeah. that idea. That's what I've been struggling with because a big part of my brain has gone, wait, people really are that hateful, or people really treat other humans with zero dignity and zero like it's just. It's, it's baffling, it's hard to understand um, mm -hmm. that others don't assign inherent worth to, to humans. Um, and really, that's what all social justice gets into, um, is the worth of a mm -hmm. human life. And so, I mean, I think that the, when, when social justice matters are politicised, uh, we've we've gone wrong because yeah, they're not absolutely. politics they're morals um, mm -hmm. but politics has taken over morals <laughs> at this stage mm -hmm. um, and and assigning yourself to a category um, almost means taking on their beliefs because you've assigned yourself rather than mm -hmm identifying with something because of your beliefs you know uh yeah it was interesting you were saying about kind of collective community and how we've lost that and with it the sense of accountability because i was listening to this podcast um called renewal in a time of crisis by a great church leader called mark sayers and he kind of said we've lost the concept of collective suffering we've kind of gone out as every man for themselves and that's kind of what's eroded our compassion and also our kind of accountability for how yeah our morals and our hearts and the fact that we can go out and be so hateful um, and he said, actually, one of the real blessings of the coronavirus, which we'll see over the coming years, is that we have a renewed concept of collective suffering. Like my next door neighbor on both sides are suffering as much as I am in the lockdown. So is the guy over the road. But he kind of was talking about what could be the social fallout of that, of, of a renewed sense of collective suffering and how that will make us more compassionate. And I think that's really fascinating. Um, yeah. yeah. And I'm, I'm always... Uh... I'm always fascinated by the kind of, I guess, the collision of like history and sociology or whatever you would call that, you know, um, yeah. because it does, you think of wartime and you think of what came of that. The, the country felt like, well, rah, rah, you know, <laughs> <laughs> um, we're all in this together. And it does, it feels okay. almost wartime or something right now. Yeah. Um, another thing about, um, this verse, Philippians 4.8, mm -hmm. um, that really struck me is that it reminds me of, I guess, what people in Kairos would call an honouring culture, mm -hmm. um, where we notice and express 
the the lovely things that God has done um, in us and in one another. Uh, and I it reminded me actually of a birthday party that I had in my house. I'm currently in my childhood bedroom actually, so <laughs> welcome. <laughs> um, yeah, so I had this bir- birthday party mm-hmm. and my friend from school was there. And at a certain point, some people <clears throat> started honouring me. Um, and they were going around the room and just saying nice things about me and nice things that they had seen um, in me or seen me do or whatever. Um, and this, uh, my friend was really touched by it. And she, you know, she was like, I, I don't know many friend groups that can express their like love and respect for one another that kind of openly and um, honestly. Mm. And I do think that that's a, another marker of Christian discipleship, Christian community, is the noticing, like you were saying, the noticing of what is lovely and what is excellent um, and the recognition of it, uh, expressing it, um, I think is something that's, that's very beautiful. And I almost, I almost forget that that's something that is you know what we do um as christians i work for kairos i work in uco so i work full time with other christians who are pursuing discipleship and um pursuing growth uh, as individuals and so to work in that environment and to be so honored and be so respected because of your worth as a brother or sister it reminds me um that that's something really special about following christ um and it's something very pure and and lovely um Mm -hmm. about this kind of life together yeah it's true i mean since i've been in leadership i've kind of spent more time observing other leaders and the number one thing i think that kind of is common to every leader is encouragement like all of them, they just kind of overflow with encouragement of, of the people they work with and the people they serve. And it, yeah, it just builds up more leaders, you know, and it's so simple in a way, kind of in the moment to just always, you know, call out the good. And it's so simple, but yet, you know, kind of difficult to do if you're not in the practice of it. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's definitely one thing I love about the, like UCOs. I've not really seen honoring culture like that anywhere else. Um, it's, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. Mm. Um. <clears throat> The last thing that I will say on this um, kind of passage and what struck me from it is that I don't, I don't even give credit to how much my thinking was converted when I was converted, you know, when I um, really chose for, for Jesus. And there's been a couple of times recently in recent years that I have thought back um, and tracked back and understood more of what was transformed. You know, this this Romans 12 thing of transform, being transformed by the renewal of your mind. That's what this verse reminds me of, is, um, mm. is the idea that we are changed really internally um, by the example of, of Christ um, and by the, the understanding of his call um, and, and the engagement, I guess, with him and with that. Yeah. So, Philippians 4, 8, beautiful verse. Think about it, folks, if you get some time, meditate on it. It's, uh, it's encouraging and it's a big part of Christian culture, I guess, uh, when you start to try and live them out. We're going to take a quick break and then we'll come back and uh, I've got a little game for you, Monique. Uh, so we'll have some fun with that. <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> Let's go to the break. (laughs) Now for a brief message from our sponsors. How's your prayer life? The question feared across the globe. Well, fear no more. With the app Pray By Day, you can enjoy a well-structured prayer time and even take part in some reflection and worship along the way. It's available for Android and iOS, so you can download now. So you can say, today I prayed thanks to pray by day and now we return to the podcast with a little game that i like to call monique or mufasa 
It's Monique or Mufasa, a bunch of quotes coming at you. You gotta think really fast. Yeah, was it said by Monique or Mufasa from the Lion King? El Rey Leon. I feel honoured that I've like been part of Ailey's karaoke now, for real. <laughs> um, so, like I said in the, the well thought through and well produced intro, um, <laughs> this game is called Monique or Mufasa. It's very simple. I am going to read you a number of quotes and you need to tell me whether it was said by you on Facebook or <laughs> by Mufasa in The Lion King. Okay. okay, let's it's, go. It's so embarrassing if I get it wrong. <laughs> I don't think you will. Okay, let's go. Monique or Mufasa? Number one, my grandma just emailed me a meme. I think maybe that's me. <laughs> Correct. That's one point to Monique. Question number two. That hairball is my son and your future king. Mufasa. Yes. <laughs> that is a Winning. classic quote from Mufasa. I Number have to do a think because we do have quite a few hairy pets at my parents' house, so I don't know. <laughs> you my sister does call the dog her son. <laughs> I knew my sister. I mean, I'm not, yeah. Just this is, Annabelle. This I'm going to name gonna, her and shame her on here. <laughs> yeah, this is going to divide the nation. <laughs> Some people are pet children people and others or very much not. Okay, uh, number three. I'm only brave when I have to be. Being brave doesn't mean you go looking for trouble. Ooh. I'm gonna go with Mufasa. Yes, it is Mufasa. But it's kind of something you could have said, right? Well, it's something I would quote from someone else. I don't think I'd ever uh, be bold enough to like have myself saying it, you know? <laughs> You hide behind the uh, wisdom of others, is that I it? Yeah, I mean, one day I'll probably have a blog, but yeah. Good. You know, for now, Good. I just do other people's quotes. It's much easier, you know. <laughs> I, I feel that. They've I also, all said it so well. <laughs> yeah, but I wonder, right, because when I like give a talk or speak to someone like a one-to-one -one or anything like that, it takes me an hour of speaking to get that three seconds of like... Yeah. Oh, that was a good quote. Do you think these people, <laughs> do you think these like Nelson Mandela's of the world just spoke for hours <laughs> and then something was picked know. up on or were they just really wise? I mean, there are some people I read like where, like C.S. Lewis, for example, like every single line is a quote, you know? <laughs> yeah. And you're just like, wow. But also I guess a lot of them, like the Eleanor Roosevelt's and stuff, did a ton of speaking that even yeah. if 10% of what she ever said got quoted. It's just, yeah. That's pretty, yeah, that's pretty, um, my faves. there's got to be a lesson in that, right? If 10% if of your life was quoted, would it be, yeah. would it be good stuff? Yeah. yeah, or I heard another thing from Carl. He said, <laughs> when Steve Clark gives a talk on a subject, he gives 10% of the amount he knows on a subject. So if he's going to agree to speak on anything, he has to make sure he knows 10 times the amount that would go in a talk. Whoa. Which I think is quite good. So like, there's actually not many topics I would, you know, speak on. <laughs> you just have to go with your area. Like next week, I'm speaking on ethical fashion, and I'm buzzing because like, I definitely know ten times more than what I'll say in a you know half an hour or whatever. Who who are you speaking to about ethical fashion? Um, to a group of youth at my church. Awesome, that's cool. Okay, back to the game. Number four. Gained a new life skill: wreath making. Props me, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're correct. That was you. I literally only say trivial things in my own voice on Facebook, <laughs> but probably my own voice on Facebook is like three percent of what I actually post. I feel like this is a little bit of misrepresentation for those who don't have me on Facebook. <laughs> this is not an attempt to defame. <laughs> Let it be known. You just have to find me. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, and the the final quote number five. Remember who you are. Well, that could be anyone. I'm going with Mufasa. <laughs> nice. It was Mufasa when he's in the clouds and he's talking to his son. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> what a beautiful time. Thank you, Monique, for playing Monique or Mufasa. <laughs>
Ailey, roll the <laughs> roll the music again. It's Monique or Mufasa, a bunch of quotes coming at you. You gotta think really fast. Yeah, was it said by Monique or Mufasa from the Lion King? El Rey Leon. Now we've come to the part of the show where uh, I'm going to introduce a segment called 4-8. What's that in reference to, you ask? 4-8 is the scripture reference for the, the verse that we were talking about. And it's something that I'd like to do for the rest of these podcasts is have my guests share a few things that they have found line up with this verse. Um, excellent, praiseworthy things. Uh, so. Monique, let's get into the segment for eight. Yeah, so I mean, in terms of honourable, noble, commendable, admirable, however your translation says it, I just love this quote. Sorry, it's a quote. <laughs> but um, I saw it going around on Facebook and it's by Fred Rogers, who's better known as Mr. Rogers, who's like a, an American kids TV star, I think. But he basically just says, when I was a boy and I would see scary things in the news, my mother would say to me, look for the helpers. You'll always find those who are helping. And I just love that because, you know, in any crisis, it's so true. And I just think I've been so struck by what I've seen going on in my neighborhood during the coronavirus lockdown. Like, it's just been beautiful, honestly, like the neighborly friendliness and kind of people checking in on other people. There was a lady who did a food bank collection and she kind of just stuck leaflets in the doors saying, obviously, people can't go out their homes. So if you have anything in your cupboard, bag it up and put it on the doorstep and I'll collect. And then of course we're all sitting around at home so i saw her driving up and her car boot like wasn't shut because she had so many bags of food and this is just people giving like whatever's in their cupboard you know yeah like and people's resources were precious at this point this was during the season of panic buying and i just thought that's amazing and that's really beautiful and yeah it's really easy to get bogged down but we just need to look at at those things and that's that. awesome similarly uh, i read about this pandemic of love website um this woman shelly in florida started it literally with her local community um and said anyone that needs help let us know and anyone that can help let us know um and now it's just blown up it's gone global and um, there are there's links for like all these different countries to get involved and all this kind of stuff but the thing that i was most touched by was that she said that in day one of the thing of the movement um she had 400 requests for help and 500 offers of help. So I was like, that was quite touching um, that there were more helpers than, you know, at that point than, than people needing the help, which just gave me a lot of, a lot of hope. Um, yeah. I thought it was pretty beautiful. Yeah, I mean, I think, again, like back on the neighbourhood, um, I've lived during lockdown with an NHS nurse. So it's been amazing to kind of see firsthand the impact of people kind of caring for frontline workers has been. And it's just uh, amazing. Like one of our neighbours dropped around a bouquet of flowers with a little sign that said, you know, not all heroes wear capes. And just kind of seeing how it's those tiny little acts of kindness that really like got her through the like crazy night shifts and the madness and all the PPE and stuff. And then again, we kind of, we baked and we baked too much. So we dropped some to one neighbor and some to another. And then one neighbor came back with like a whole load of ready meals that they'd received. And the other neighbor came back with our tin with something else they'd baked in it. And, you know, oh. just kind of the relationships that have been built, which have been great. Another thing that I had, uh, which is just on a more personal note, uh, my dad just turned 60. He's a great man, great dad, great example of a Christian life. And that's simply just excellent. <laughs> That's wonderful. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, the first thing on the list is truth. And um, one of the things I've kind of been thinking about, obviously, you know, at these uncertain times when there's quite a lot of chaos going on, you know, that's one of the most important on this list that we're clinging to truth, that we're clinging to Jesus, who is our rock, who's our firm foundation. And I think um, there's just a story that's always stuck with me. I went to St. Paul's Cathedral in London to hear Rowan Williams speak. Oh, like it was probably two years ago, but it's like so vivid in my mind. And he, had a room of about 2,000 people. He's an Oxford professor of theology. And after his talk, they did a Q&A and someone asked the question, uh, why do you love Jesus? And <laughs> they asked him it right at the very end. And he was just kind of silent for like 20 seconds because, you know, it's just so basic and so fundamental and almost like too personal. And um, there were like 2,000 people waiting. And I was like, oh my goodness, what is he going to say? Because like, <laughs> and he just went, 
well, he's my hope. He's the ground of all my being, you know, and then just stopped and it was like mic drop moment. And I just thought, gosh, it's true. Like if I really had to come to it and say like, what, what is Jesus to me? You know, I just felt he's my hope, you know, and that's the thing that we forget all the time. And I'm always having to go, no, like that's where my hope is and it's secure and it's firm. And, you know, it's the same hope that an Oxford professor has and a little normal me, you know, <laughs> and I just love that. That's awesome. A lot. That's beautiful. Um, my last thing again is just something that has been helpful and and um, lovely to me in the in particularly right now in the pandemic and stuff is um, Brenny Brown, um, yeah. the the speaker, author, uh, statistician, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, she's just I I find that her writing and her speaking is realistic and helpful, and it's pretty simple, you know. Um, concepts and I like that she shapes her findings on data um, and it's it's very like this is a reality so here's my kind of answer to the reality or something um, she yeah her stuff tends to to bring me some peace uh, when there's you know a lot of stormy thoughts and opinions and all of that kind of stuff well amen Philippians 4 8 things are excellent things are praiseworthy there is always hope there's always light that's uh that's cool <laughs> I don't know uh words within the English language that do it justice but yeah it's a cool thing um so Monique before we end here uh, I wanted to give you a chance to invite our audience um, to pray for anything in particular that, that you've got going on or that's um, going on over there in, in London town. Um, so anything you'd like some prayers for, let us know. Thank you. Oh, yeah, I'd love some prayer. Um, I guess in terms of Koinonia, we're starting a men's summer household, I think either this week or next week. Uh, I think probably some in person, some online. So just prayer that that goes well. Obviously, this is all new territory for us. Um, on a similar note, I'm helping prep the September SWAT, which will also be online. It's going to be great. But prayer as we kind of plan that again, uh, it's all very new, but also exciting. Um, in terms of me, I guess um, that I've used my time well this summer. It's kind of rare that I'm in one place with not much ahead other than, a, you know, a bit of work. Um, so just prayer that I use my time well and it's fruitful. Definitely. I'll, I'll be praying. Hopefully our audience uh, at home will also <laughs> keep that in their prayers. <laughs> I have been I have been bowled over by how powerful God has been among our UCOs in the in the pandemic, in the virtual mm -hmm. UCO meetings, in people being separated or households having to go home or anything like that. It's just been incredible to see the amount of um, of joy and unity that that. Uh, has been in the different UCOs around regardless um, I think it's just just awesome yeah. well Monique thank you so much for coming on the podcast I really appreciate it it's been a, a joy um, and I will be keeping those things in my prayers um, audience please be sure to follow us to like to subscribe to all of those things um so that you get updates when these podcasts go up um but for now goodbye and god bless goodbye thanks monique that was awesome thank you no, really appreciate great. it